All right, so I think uh, we've seen a bunch of people sign in, so we're just gonna get started. Uh, hello everyone and welcome once again to our fireside chat with Professor Alex Vitale on policing. Now, we've done a couple events similar to this before, and one of the reasons we decided to call this a fireside chat, um, well, there was an earlier version where we were gonna have like a fire pit going, we, we scrapped that at some point, but it's still, we wanna keep that sort of casual but serious back and forth with uh, Professor Vitali because you know he's somebody I've known for a long time. He is a well-renowned expert in the field of police reform. He's written this book that some of you may be aware of, The End of Policing. Um, he is a professor at Brooklyn College and the uh, coordinator for the Policing and Social Justice Project there. And somebody who I've gone to many times over the years to get answers to questions about police practices and how we can reform the system. Uh, we first met uh, back when I was policy counsel at the Civilian Complaint Review Board. Uh, I had read something, an article he wrote and, and wanted to talk to the author and figure out what was going on because at the time I was trying to figure out how to hold the police accountable through uh, the, you know, the civilian oversight mechanism we have as a city. Uh, we then got to see each other again during the Close Rikers campaign. Uh, Alex was a regular member of the Close Rikers uh, coalition and their meetings and presented to the coalition about policing in particular. Um, and so we want to have this fireside chat where he's going to ask me a bunch of questions, but unlike a lot of regular interviews, uh, I'm going to occasionally throw it back at him too, because there are questions I have about how we get to a very different uh, policing system than the one we have now, where I'm curious what he thinks the answers are. So uh, I guess with that introduction, um, I'll turn it over to Alex Vitali. Um, just a couple of housekeeping notes before I, I give them the, the mic. Number one, we're going to definitely do Q&A like we always do. Uh, Alex has a number of questions that uh, he's going to ask me first, so we'll probably turn to the audience about halfway or 40 minutes in. But you can start thinking about your questions now, and when you're ready, you can either uh, put them into the chat uh, or you can raise your hand. And then Christina, who is behind the wheel as usual, uh, uh, working this, she can call on you and that way you can ask your question uh, on video. So those are your two choices for Q&A. Um, we'll be going for about an hour. So with that, I'm really pleased to welcome to our fireside chat, Alex Vitale. Thank you, Donos. It's a real pleasure to, to do this and to have a kind of public conversation instead of one of our private conversations over coffee or lunch or something. So we'll see uh, how the uh, flavor of this uh, new format is. Uh, you, you talked a little bit about uh, how long we've known each other and I've, it's been really interesting to see the trajectory of your career and its relationship to these larger conversations about what to do about the criminal justice system. And the really unexpected uh, development of just how important these progressive DA candidacies have been uh, across the country in helping to reshape the narrative about you know, the nature of the criminal justice system, but more importantly, what we mean by justice, which I think has gotten really lost uh, in our societal kind of obsession with equating justice with revenge and retribution. Uh, so I'm really glad to do anything I can to, to contribute to the, you know, advancing uh, uh, just a better conversation about these issues. So uh, Janice, I'll just jump in with some questions. And like, like you said, feel free to, to you know, put things back on me, uh, bring up your own issues, et cetera. So uh, one uh, thing that I was really impressed with was, uh, in the fall, you issued a pretty detailed plan about how to reduce the population at Rikers and put some, some numeric targets on that, that, you know, thinking about the impact of very specific interventions and how that could get us down to the kind of population where, where we wouldn't need to rely on Rikers Island anymore. So can you tell us a little bit about the genesis of, of that concept and, and where you think it stands today. Absolutely, so what I was referring to is this fall, the very first policy paper that this campaign released is a commitment to cut the number of uh, Manhattan defendants in jail by 80% uh, when we take over the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. 
And that's rooted really in two uh, concepts, one of which came uh, during my time at Just Leadership and the other during my time at the ACLU. So while I was uh, at Just Leadership USA, where I was the director of policy and campaigns, uh, I managed the Close Rikers campaign. And that campaign had three fundamental goals. Number one, to get to the island shuttered, right? To close Rikers Island, as the name suggests, right? And we organized specifically with that in mind. Number two, to significantly reduce the number of people in the New York City jail system. It's pretty simple. You can't close Rikers Island if there are so many people in the New York City jail system that there's nowhere for them to be held. So you can only close Rikers if you're reducing the number of people in jail by a significant amount. And number three, if you ever see a closed Rikers memorabilia, it says closed Rikers build communities. And what that means is investing in communities that have been hardest hit by mass incarceration, least invested in by our government, uh, and giving people the tools that they need to be safe, be healthy, and succeed so that they don't get caught up in the criminal justice system. Uh, so it's been on my mind for quite a while how we're going to reduce the number of people in jail so that we can close Rikers. What made this proposal specific to Manhattan DA's office uh, relates to something that I learned when I was managing the Smart Justice Campaign at the ACLU. This is the ACLU's 50 state decarceration initiative that I managed uh, until recently when I stepped away to uh, run for office. So uh, what we learned during the Smart Justice Campaign, working with, uh, against, you know, looking to replace district attorneys around the United States is that this idea of a specific target for decarceration was actually a really helpful way to measure whether a candidate was actually a quote progressive DA candidate or just using the rhetoric. Uh, so for example, a lot of people these days say they're for criminal justice reform. A lot of people say they're for fixing the bail system, ending mass incarceration. These are all somewhat vague terms, but if you could get a candidate for district attorney in Dallas, Texas to say, that he was committed to reducing the number of people in jail in Dallas County by 25% during his first term. Well, now that's a real commitment. And uh, that's something that you can hold him to once he wins. Uh, you can push and say, why not more? Um, you can, as an, another candidate could come in and try to make the argument for why they could do more or maybe why they would wanna do less. So I really became attracted to having this percentage-based target as a way, first of all, to share my thinking with voters and with, with organizations and with, with anybody else who cares about this race. And also so that I can be held accountable so that if I win this race, people can look at our track record once we're in office and say, they're getting towards that 80% that they promised. Um, the way we laid out the 80% goal is taking uh, the most common reasons people come through the criminal justice system in Manhattan and figuring out ways that we can avoid jail and prison except as a last resort. Now, we can get deeper into this later in the conversation, Alex, but I'm of the mindset that jail and prison is virtually never the right solution to society's problem. It's sometimes the only one that we can come up with, right? We have not come up with a whole bunch of creative ways to handle it when somebody, for example, takes the life of another person. Um, and so we send those folks to jail and to prison. But no one would, I think, argue that that is helpful to the situation. It's just the only answer that we've been able to come up with. There are a great many other situations, however, where we actually do have much better answers in jail and prison. If somebody is clearly struggling with mental health issues and that affects uh, their behavior, then putting them into a jail cell is only gonna make things worse, not better. If somebody commits an act of economic dis uh, desperation, sure, we can lock them up for a month or two months or a year, but that's not gonna solve the problem. That's not gonna change the underlying reasons that they may have committed that act. Instead, we need to focus on getting them on an economically sustainable path. If somebody has a substance use issue, again, it would be better for all in society, uh, the person uh, who's being accused, the people they might have harmed, uh, for them to be able to turn their lives around. So what I lay out in our 80% paper is if you go through all the different reasons, broad strokes reasons why people wind up in our jail pre-trial, um, for about 80% of the cases, we actually know what we ought to be doing and we just need to invest in the resources to make uh, to, to scale up some of the programs we have. And, you know, for some more serious offenses, and we're talking very serious uh, crimes here, we don't yet have the answers for what we would do instead. And I'm always open to working with community groups, with lawyers, law enforcement, with anybody who comes up with an idea here, but that's sort of how we came to our conclusion.
Well, let's, we'll talk about some of that stuff in a minute. I, I certainly have some ideas and, and have been uh, doing some work about how to deal even with what we call serious crime issues. Um, but let's, let's just stick on the Rikers thing for a second. So with the combination of, of social distancing and some of the state reforms that were put in place this year, we've already seen a dramatic reduction in the population of Rikers. What do you think about the, the prospects, especially given the budget situation, that the kind of closed Rikers plan as outlined is gonna go through? Do you, do you really need to build new capacity out in the boroughs before we can start shutting down facilities at Rikers? Uh, or can we just reduce the population enough uh, with the facilities that we have? That's a great question. And it's one that I definitely uh, wanted to have a louder, longer conversation about uh, in the fall of 2019. Look, when the New York City Council voted to authorize the construction of four large new jails uh, in the boroughs, um, I wrote an article saying that I did not think that was necessary. And I think that we needed to spend more time talking about how to close Rikers without building new jails. I think there are good faith arguments and you hear them from people, including directly impacted communities for why some of the existing facilities we have are really, uh, even in the boroughs are really problematic or why um, increasing capacity in some boroughs would make facilitate Rikers closing faster. But look, at the end of the day, um, as you pointed out, the population at Rikers is going down dramatically. It has been for a while, actually. You know, when we started the campaign, there are almost 10,000 people uh, in New York City jails. Today, the number is something like 4,800. And if we just keep the momentum that we're, we're doing with criminal justice reforms, with programs that keep people um, on the right path if they do come into contact with the criminal legal system, we can keep driving that number down and perhaps reach a point where we don't need to build any facilities uh, in the boroughs, and we can close Rikers. Now, speaking for Manhattan specifically, in Manhattan, you have a, a jail, the, not, not a, very, a very unpleasant one, to be honest, to be clear, uh, the Tombs, but the Tombs has capacity of about 880 beds. Um, so I would argue that when I'm district attorney, we're not going to need more than 880 beds. We'll need far fewer than that in Manhattan. So that would sort of obviate the need for a new jail in Manhattan. And uh, given that we're in such a budget crunch now, what I'm most concerned about is this, you start hearing this buzz from certain, particularly sort of centrist people in, in city government saying, well, we may not have the money to build new jails, so the whole closed Rikers plan has to be put on ice. It was never the intention of the closed Rikers campaign or the many, many organizations that allied with it and the council members that allied with it, that closing Rikers was contingent on building a bunch of new jails. Um, so I think we need to be thinking if indeed we don't have the money to do it, all the more reason to open up the conversation again and figure out how low can we drive the numbers in the next couple of years so that maybe we can close Rikers without building new jails. You know, and one of my, one of my concerns about the progressive prosecutor movement has been that while there's this very important emphasis on decarceration as such, and some focus on like reentry services, not quite as much attention has been paid on the kind of preventative interventions that will keep people from ever coming into contact with the criminal justice system in the first place. And this, this requires two things. One, uh, an emphasis on policing, try to reduce the scope and impact of policing, but also the creation of the kinds of services, and community infrastructures that will help people not be a source of public disorder, crime, however we want to define these things. So what are your feelings first about trying to reduce the scope of the NYPD. There are a number of uh, proposals right now, Communities United for Police Reform, Close Rikers, the Police Reform Organizing Project, and, and my own project, we've, we've called for a billion dollar reduction in the NYPD budget over four years. Are you in favor of those kinds of budget interventions? Absolutely. Uh I have signed on to a couple of those. Honestly, there are now there are several, so it's hard to remember which exactly. I've yes. definitely signed up to the 
the police reform organizing project one. I'm supportive of the CPR letter. Um, and here's what it comes down to. We have a budget crisis in the city right now. And it's obvious uh, to anybody, right? We're all going through COVID-19 together. We know that this is gonna be a very hard, not just one year, but a couple of years economically for New York City and for New York State. So the question is, what do we prioritize in this budget? With the NYPD, you've got a budget that has increased $800 million since Mayor de Blasio took office. In my view, it's unconscionable to talk about shutting down summer youth employment programs, uh, as Governor Cuomo has done, cutting money to schools and to Medicaid, all while, on the other hand, saying that NYPD is so essential that we have to maintain basically flat spending on the NYPD. I think that's totally mistaken. Um, I very much support shrinking the budget of the NYPD, both this year in a sort of one year budget, but also in the long run. And the way you do that is, in my view, there's, there's a number of ways you could do it. In my view, the way you do it is through attrition. So when we were doing the Close Rikers campaign, this came up in the context of corrections as well. You know, we spend about $2 billion a year on corrections in New York City. That comes out to about $300,000 per person per year locked up on Rikers Island. That's clearly a, a terrible use of money. And the main use of that money is correction officers. Now, when we, when we did that campaign, there were a lot of people who said, well, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with a bunch of correction officers being laid off. Um, th these folks come from their New York State residents too, their middle-class jobs. And my response was, our response was, if you look at the way attrition works, right? People, so many people leave the force each year. You just replace them with fewer people than left. And within a certain number of years, you can really scale down the size of the correction staff, save an enormous amount of money, and you don't have to fire anybody. That would be my inclination when it comes to the NYPD. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not super in favor of, of people being laid off during a pandemic, but I think given how large NYPD classes are, you could go to attrition pretty quickly. Um, and I think that would make an enormous budget impact. One last thing I'll say, and this is a place where I definitely do have a question for you. Yeah, you know, I know that in, in your letter, your organizational letter, you talk about the fact that there were 1,300 new police officers added during the de Blasio administration, something that you opposed, that I opposed. And, you know, it's, it felt like a lot of activists opposed it, even though the city council overwhelmingly put it through. Um, I think that that to me shows that there's definitely room for trimming the size of the NYPD in the short term. But I'm, I would like to ask you, Alex, I mean, how do you make your, how do you get make your budget math work? Like, how do you come to a billion dollars in four years? Um, in a way that sort of makes sense based on what the NYPD spends its money on. Yeah, well, so a, a few things. In, in addition to uh, hiring freeze and using attrition, you can also look at overtime. Uh, the overtime bill now at the NYPD alone is about $600 million a year. So there's no reason why we can't significantly draw, uh, draw that down especially if we reduce our reliance on certain kinds of really problematic policing that generates a fair amount of overtime, like narcotics, vice, gang suppression, homeless outreach. These are just tasks they shouldn't be doing in the first place. And if we start dialing back those responsibilities, that's going to free up overtime money. The other thing uh, that we can do is look at some very specialized programs that need to go, domain awareness, get about $18 million just from that. Uh, they wanna spend an additional $10 million, no, $18 million this year hiring more school police. I think that's a terrible idea. Uh, also, we can, we can look at the kinds of uh, settlement money that's being paid out. The NYPD has never really been held accountable for those payouts. And those payouts often are tied to exactly the units that I think should, should be put out of business in the first place. Anti-crime units, narcotics units, vice units. These are often the cowboys in the NYPD who get the most complaints and who have to put out the most settlement money. So, um, I think there's a lot we can do to get to that uh, billion dollar number. I mean, just just cutting the overtime is uh, in half would be a huge, huge improvement. Yeah, can I jump in on that? Um, Alex, yeah. you know, talking about uh, overtime, 
I, I tend to have, since I've announced, there are some assistant district attorneys from various offices who reach out to me now, you know, privately to share their frustrations with their work. And there was one who, in particular who told me about a Friday evening that he spent waiting for hours while basically the arresting officer in the case he was assigned to ran out the clock trying to maximize overtime, you know, from 8 p.m., 9 p.m., 10 p.m., until basically he got the maximum number of hours he could, and then he finished the paperwork. Um, it seems like there is a very twisted tie in the way the NYPD operates between, um, you know, arrest being a measurement of success, overtime, you know, only occurring in certain situations that really, really incentivizes police officers to make bad arrests at the end of their shift and maximize the number of hours of overtime they can get. It just seems like a, a, a you know, an insidious, but also administrative problem at the same time. We've got a term for it. It's called collars for dollars. And the, the, the police are well aware of how this works and they do very little co to control it. And uh, it, it uses not so much average everyday patrol officers. There's a little bit more oversight of what they're doing out in the field. It's more these specialized units, detectives and supervisors who push the needle on this. And you've got a lot of people in the NYPD who are making $25,000, $30,000 a year in overtime. And this is well known within the department. And ironically, you mentioned the 1,300 officers. One of the big selling points that was given to the public for why they should support this is that it would reduce the overtime budget. And it didn't. Overtime has gone up every year since they added those additional officers. And then there's just one other thing that I think we should consider in terms of the budget reduction, and that's job transfers. I think we could start with civilian personnel, but even uniform personnel, and this is true for, for the uh, Department of Corrections as well. I, I published a piece in the Daily News during the Close Rikers campaign that said that instead of defending these corrections jobs, and the same thing for policing jobs, these unions should use some of their power to guarantee job transfers with no loss of pay or benefits, especially for corrections officers. They hate working at Rikers Island. The union itself constantly sues the city over the terrible working conditions. The commute is terrible. And most of those folks come from communities where there's a high level of criminalization. And a lot of them would much rather be working in a community center, mentoring young people, doing something positive for their neighborhoods, but there were no jobs doing that work. And we need to demand that there are those jobs and that we can start shifting people into that. So let me let me ask let me ask you the, I, I uh, agree. the next question. So you know the, the DA's office has a budget too, and the Manhattan DA in particular has a pretty significant budget because of its ability to get uh, you know civil settlements and, and large fines on the white collar side. So what are your ideas about trying to re, you know, Vance has used a lot of that money to incentivize various parts of the criminal justice system, to create predictive policing algorithms and to, you know, fund specialized units and whatnot. What about shifting some of those monies into the kinds of targeted community investments that are called for in things like the Build Communities Program from Just Leadership? Yeah, th so this is a, a really great question, one that, that I get a lot and have honestly uh, spent a lot of time thinking about and evolved my thinking on somewhat. So uh, to, for people who, who don't know this issue, uh, as Alex said, the Manhattan Day does have access to a very large pot of discretionary funding that uh, is unlike any other DA's office, including other DA's offices in the city. And Cy Vance has used it, I would say, for a combination of good, mediocre, and terrible things. Um, the terrible ones, like you said, are you know basically any additional investment into NYPD doesn't strike me as anything that makes sense given their $6 billion budget. 
He has also allocated $40 million recently to fund more police in the subway system, which is something that I publicly oppose vehemently. Um, when I say mediocre, um, you know, there, there are programs at John Jay that are funded in this way. Some of them are fine programs. I say mediocre because I don't know if that's the best use of these funds, right, versus other sources of, of funding for John Jay. And then there are legitimately good uses. Um, there are nonprofits that do good work that take this funding and, and they express concern about taking it. They're asking, they, I've had people ask me, should I take this grant? Will it mean that I'm not allowed to criticize Cy Vance? And where, where I've come out on this is um, I've been pushed by people to accept participatory budgeting, uh, which is something that I'm in favor of in concept, uh, but I also really want this money to be used for things for programs and for helping the kind of people who are not going to get support through other, through other political means. So what I mean by that is uh, if you're talking about um, certain kinds of, of programs in the community uh, around, um, you know, around young people, for example, uh, the city council often does fund programs like that. It's like there are certain programs that are not that controversial. Um, there are other programs uh, that are you know, a little bit edgier perhaps a little bit more controversial, things that people might be less likely to support through the conventional budget process. You know, I'm thinking if there are interventions, for example, with people who have serious mental illnesses, who commit violent acts, and they need a lot of, you know, professional focused attention, that's the kind of thing that I don't know that there will be a council member or assembly member who champions that cause, because that constituency is not politically powerful. But it's so important if we're going to get at the root of, um, you know, what's happening in our criminal legal system. So my intuition would be to direct those funds towards programs that work with uh, with populations that otherwise don't have a lot of political support. You know, there are certain young people who get you know in minor trouble with the law, and then there are certain who get in very serious trouble with the law. I think intervening with the latter group of kids and working with them to get their lives back on track when they're 15, 16, 17 is worth every dollar spent. And that's the kind of program that I really would love to invest those resources in. And as to who exactly gets that money, perhaps that's where participatory budgeting comes in. Because having observed this, um, seeing friends and allies agonize over taking money from the DA's office, I want to make sure there's something of a wall between um, anybody in the DA's office and the people getting this money so that they can feel like they can do their work unencumbered and there aren't shady politics around what people say and what people do um, because they wanna keep receiving money from the district attorney's office. So those are some of my thoughts on how we'd spend that discretionary funding. You know, there's, there's a funny dynamic, right? Where a lot of effort is spent to help kids who get you have small problems who get busted on graffiti or one time a drug charge or something like that. And then there's a tendency to say the kids that do serious things, well, their, their problems are really big and maybe there's nothing we can do for them. But the research tends to show that actually the kids that do small things, most of them don't need any intervention. They're just being kids. And the ones who do big things are actually the ones who benefit the most from targeted, sustained interventions because they can really have their lives turned around by that kind of intervention. While the kid who does graffiti just needs to get a little older and will well, you know, turn you know what really hit the Yeah, you know what really crystallized that for me? Uh, when I was in law school, I. Um, I started and, and ran a program for incarcerated 16 and 7 year olds at Rikers Island. Um, program ran for about five years. I was involved for about three. And we specifically work with 16 and 17 year olds at the RNDC facility on Rikers doing, um, we work on the fourth, fifth and sixth amendment, uh, their rights in the jail system. We do debates, talk about current affairs. And uh, I remember one time we had gone into a conversation about the first time they all got arrested. So we went around the room and asked everybody the age at which they first got arrested. And the answers were mostly 11 to 13. And at the time, you know, I was in law school sort of newer to this space. I was legitimately shocked by that. I was like, how can, how can an 11 year old get arrested for anything? Um, I now 
you know, work with a family where a 10 year old got arrested. So now I see it, but at the time I was sort of shocked by it. And so we sort of dug into the kind of things 11 year olds and 12 year olds get arrested for. And, you know, it, it was things like, uh, you know, throwing, throwing rocks at a, at, a, at a building or, you know, wrestling in the park or things that like the kind of thing kids do all the time to your point. And I think about this city that we live in New York where you have private schools, you have um, elite public schools and the way they manage their problems with young people is very different than how we manage problems with young people in the community and how we manage problems with young people in the kind of schools that have police in the schools, right? It's not like there aren't problems in elite private schools in New York with 14, 15, 16 year olds. This is like a difficult age, but when there's a fight or if a kid has drugs or if a kid graffiti is a building, they think of, well, what are other solutions we can come up with? And of course, the reason they do that is because you know, they don't want an angry elite parent on their case about it. But at the end of the day, that's the model we should be going towards, right? That's how we should be solving those problems like private school to handle their problem with kids, recognizing that young people make mistakes, they do impulsive things, and with the right nurturing and support, they grow out of it like so many of us do. And so I always think about those kids at Rikers talking about their first arrest as 11 year olds when I think about this particular issue about when we give up on kids and when we support them. Yeah, they, they already have police abolition in those elite schools. And part of the reason the parents are angry if the police are called is because they know that nothing good can come from that for their kids. But somehow for you know black and brown kids in the public school system, that's the only good intervention is you know, to get them involved in the criminal justice system, which does nothing good for them in the vast majority of cases. Absolutely. And just, you know, along those lines, talking about young people, you know, one of my biggest problems with Vance has been his central role in reframing the city's violence problem as a gang problem and his involvement in use of large-scale gang conspiracy cases, the setting up of these predictive policing algorithms to identify you know, who the problem young people are, and then you know, maximizing punitive prosecutorial power is the primary strategy for dealing with them. So you know, we, we issued a report in December, the Policing and Social Justice Project about what a bad idea this is, what some of the alternatives would look like. So um, you would be in a position to bring about, you know, a major change in policy on this. Absolutely. Um, I've been thinking for the last number of months in particular, why the current approach to quote, gang policing, gang prosecution is so attractive. And I think it's because at root, it gives some comfort to the prosecution and to the police who do it to think that there is a coordinated system of crime that they can they can just take it down they can solve the underlying issues in our communities i think that's really what's ultimately going on here because to as you well know alex but just for people watching uh Cy Vance has been involved in some very prominent very high profile uh takedown quote takedowns where uh the manhattan da's office and the police and the feds in some cases have arrested large numbers of people, uh, particularly in NYCHA houses, um, accused them all of being in a gang and tried to tie all of their activity towards uh, some particularly heinous crime. Like for example, if there's a murder saying, you know, that this whole gang may have been involved and you can tell by, look, they're in Facebook photos together, they're known associates, et cetera. And basically criminalizing entire buildings, entire housing complexes. And that's just not the reality of how how crime operates. Uh, that's not the reality of how uh, these neighborhoods function. And uh, I'm very much opposed to continuing that model of, of policing and prosecuting where we just assume that everybody who knows each other is involved in the same criminal gang that warrants arrest, prosecution, and prison. Um, as, as your research and your, your colleagues, Professor Babe Powell, for those who don't know or have shown, there's really not a lot of evidence to support that there are these large coordinated gangs roaming the city causing mayhem. Um, and I think the reality is a little bit harder to wrestle with. Why are crimes happening in some of these neighborhoods, including very heinous crimes? Um, you know, they, that, that is a tougher nut to crack. And 
you know, it requires, I think, first and foremost, getting closer to the community, understanding what is happening there and, you know, who, you know, understanding why certain people uh, have gotten into these situations and, and, and who they are and what their close relationships are rather than lumping everybody together as a gang. I think there needs to be much more, uh, we need to be much more uh, accurate about who we lump into the criminal legal system. Because once somebody's uh, lumped in and they pick up a felony acute charge and uh, then their whole lives can be turned upside down. And that happened in the case of Cy Vance's prosecution in the grand houses where there were people who were taken out of school and lost work and put in jail pre-trial for months before their charges were dropped. Their lives are upended because of this quote gang affiliation. Um, so we need to be much more uh, precise about how we go about this and not rely on these sort of sweeping gang cases. You know, when you talk to people like violence interrupters and other groups that work in the neighborhood, and, and I ask them, you know, why, why is there violence in your neighborhood specifically? And, and I know enough to know that people can only really speak to their very specific neighborhood. Nobody really has any idea why violence is happening everywhere. You can only ask people about their specific neighborhood and they say, you know, sometimes it's dumb stuff escalates and that's why violence interrupters try to step in. Um, but that's not a gang. That's, that's um, people feuding and that's sometimes escalating, sometimes to dangerous levels. And there are so many different places where community organizations or even the police could step in in a way that'll uh, stop things before they escalate. But certainly doing huge sweeps and arresting 40 people at a time is not the answer. And I know, I know you had William from Neighborhood Benches on with you uh, cooking dinner last week. That's right. Uh, so uh, I think that these kinds of community-based anti-violence initiatives like Cure Violence and then some of the more informal ones like Neighborhood Benches um, are kind of key to making progress, even on the violent crime side. You know, again, there's this idea that somehow the violent crime is so terrible, so off the charts that whoever does that is you know, a hardened criminal for life. And so we just need to lock them up and throw away the key. But we can understand violence in a very different way that, that violence is widely distributed, is somewhat you know, random at times. And even kids who are, who are more committed to violence they're not beyond hope. They're embedded in social networks. They're making complicated choices and that high quality community-based interventions can, can really make a difference. I, I absolutely agree with that. And I'll also say, you know, we as a campaign uh, care very deeply about organizing most directly impacted communities. And before COVID-19, we're on our way towards trying to knock on every NYCHA door in Manhattan. Uh, there are about 50,000 apartments uh, in NYCHA that are in Manhattan, Manhattan complexes. And as you know, when, when you talk to people in NYCHA, there's nuance to this, right? People do complain about crime. They complain about um, things that are happening in their hallways and their lobbies. And they complain about certain neighbors um, carrying on with behavior that is to the detriment of other neighbors. And what we would try to originally posed to people to get the conversations going is, you know, do you support, do you want more police or less police present in this situation? And I'll never forget when we were, we were in the Holmes Towers on uh, the 91st Street on the east side. And, you know, I asked a man this and he stepped out of his apartment and, and thought for a minute about what he wanted to say. And he said, the problem with the police is that they're always in your business when nothing's going on and they're never around when you need them. And I think that's really the key here is that if people feel like the police are not responding to very basic issues that people have, but then they are, you know, sweeping the building in, you know, with, uh, you know, with riot gear and arresting a whole bunch of people in the middle of the night, um, that's just not going to ever build trust uh, between law enforcement and the community. And so when I think about what we do in our district attorney's office, we have to have a much more real honest, intimate relationship with these communities to understand, you know, when do you want intervention? What does that look like? And, and how can we do that in a way that really stops the cycle of harm from happening rather than just letting problems fester and then coming in and arresting a bunch of people? Yeah, you know, this, this under-policing 
over policing or over policing under protection problem is something that you hear a lot when you talk to folks who are in neighborhoods that, that have a lot of problems. And I've been trying to think about this a little bit more critically because part of what that assumes is that there is this right miss mission for policing that if they just focused on the right things on the violent crime or getting the bank robbers or something that this would restore trust in policing and that you know policing could kind of um, reach some ideal condition my, my concern with this is that there's not a lot of reason to actually think that good policing is going to help solve even violent crime or bank robberies or rapes or any of the rest of it. That how do police, for instance, solve a homicide in a community that, for instance, is reluctant to cooperate with police because there's a lot of involvement in black market activity, people have outstanding warrants, right? That, that it's a, a disadvantaged neighborhood that's always going to be in trouble with the criminal justice system. Well, what do they do? They make a lot of low level arrests in hopes of getting someone to give up information in exchange for leniency. So then you're right back to widespread, aggressive, low level policing. I just don't think you can do policing in a place like NYCHA in a way that is going to look like this fantasy of community policing or something that instead we need to really look at every possibility of intervening before to, to engage those preventative possibilities so that we don't have to come rely on police in the first place. Yeah, you know, that's, that, that's a, a great point. It reminds me of something that, um, the NYPD just had its its budget uh, hearing, which uh, is is relevant, of course, to the earlier part of our conversation talking about the NYPD budget. And uh, I was struck by Commissioner Shea um, in arguing for the maintenance of their existing budget, saying, "You know, the police are just called on to do so many things." <laughs> and I think that is where you know probably he would agree with us, right? That it's uh, or maybe not. No, he probably wouldn't agree with us, but. Uh, I think the point he was making, I agreed with in that we have as a city government, um, as, a, as a body politic, um, look to the NYPD to do a whole number of things that uh, they are not good at. And to your point, they may, they may never be good at, right? They may never be good at, you know, um, patrolling NYCHA buildings and settling disputes versus uh, leadership from that building empowered to do the same, you know, without weapons or power of arrest, right? Uh, so, so I agree with you that there are probably a large number of tasks that we currently ask NYP to do, and this includes, um, you know, inter, uh, talking to people experiencing homelessness on the subway, um, answering responses to people who have mental illness from 311. Um, there are a whole number of issues where NYP are being asked to do things that they aren't good at, uh, and they aren't trained for, and probably will never be good at. Uh, and if I could take the conversation to this place, uh, one of those things is social distancing. And, what, and what's striking to me is when, when we first heard, and I talk about me, my, my campaign team, first heard that uh, Governor Cuomo and Bill de Blasio uh, claimed that the NYPD was gonna enforce social distancing, it was so obvious that that was gonna go poorly. We knew there was gonna be racially disparate enforcement uh, leading to you know, racist numbers of arrests and tickets. We knew that there would be increased police violence because everybody's on edge right now in New York City and approaching somebody with a taser telling them to back up and socially distance is going to lead to problems. Um, and we knew that ultimately this is about culture. This is about creating a culture where people feel some responsibility to wear masks. They understand why it's important to social distance. They understand why this, how this virus works. I mean, this is really an educational cultural issue that we're in the middle of with this pandemic and police are not well suited to do any of those things. And so we, we have called for the beginning that NYP should not lead. What we quickly then saw, we were actually kind of heartened to see how many people agreed like uh, public advocate Williams and council members and uh, state senators all, all basically put out statements saying similar things. So we thought, okay, what is the solution then? And today we in city limits, we released a pretty detailed plan 
or how communities could be empowered to uh, take the lead on social distancing and other public health measures during COVID-19. How we could basically use a neighborhood model and, and uh, last, I talked about this the other night with William from Neighborhood Benches because to use them as example, Neighborhood Benches has a very strong presence from about 125th Street to 145th Street, give or take. Um, not that well known outside of that area or the South Bronx, but you give them the area where they are well known. You invest resources in them to do the work of distributing masks, educating people about social distancing, enrolling young people to educate young people, NYCHA residents to educate NYCHA residents, and really say, this is, this is your responsibility. We trust you as a city we, with the responsibility to make it work here. And you start doing that across the city with uh, violence interruption groups, with uh, sometimes religious groups, depending on the neighborhood, sometimes mutual aid groups, depending on the neighborhood. And that's how you really get much better results on responding to a public health crisis. And notice I didn't say the NYPD for any of that. The NYPD would be still there if there was a 911 call about a criminal emergency, but they would have no role in the actual execution of enforcing social distancing. And so we put that out today and, uh, and we hope that it provides something of a blueprint for other elected officials who say they agree with this in concept to, to move forward. Uh, let me just ask you one more quick question that I think you, you have a short answer to. It's one more area that maybe we could get the police out of, and that's the, uh, that's the prosecution of sex work. Oh, yeah, that is a short answer. I, I fully support the decrim movement and uh, don't think that there should be policing of sex work. I think it should be decriminalized and uh, am generally following the lead of advocates on that. You know, fortunately, Manhattan doesn't have quite the issue of some of the outer boroughs when it comes to the way sex workers are treated. And that's because of advocacy work that sex workers did when I was in law school. I distinctly remember the, the campaign. Uh, at the time I was in law school, there were sex workers being arrested because when their purses were searched, uh, condoms would be found and be used as evidence that they were sex workers. And that led to a big outcry and a, and a change in policy. Um, so, but yes, the short answer, I started rambling there. The short answer is yes, I support getting the police out of that. Well, I think we might uh, see if we've got some questions from the audience at this point. We've been jibber jabbering on about 45 minutes. So I think people can put something in the chat or they can even raise their hand if they want and we might call on them if that's technically possible. You could. Hey, Christina, just let us know. If there is anything. Yeah, so right Another now we don't have any. Ask, and Janice, so, yeah, you're we welcome to ask right me. Now. Sorry. <laughs> All right. We don't have any questions right now, um, but there are, as, as Alex and Yano said, we have two ways of asking questions. You could either chat it to me and I'll ask it for you, or if you wanted to appear on camera, when you go to participants, um, click the button that has raised hand, I'll call on you, I will unmute you, and you could ask your question. Uh, right now, we don't have any questions so far. Did, did uh, so anyone, just, did we, are we monitoring the Facebook chat? Did we figure that out also? Yes. Yeah, Simone is on that and um, she's mentioned to me that we don't have any questions so far. So um, you guys can keep talking. So Janice, do you have any, do you have any questions for me about some of these issues or? Sure, you know, um, so uh, as you know, as we've talked about uh, in the past, I I've worked on some campaigns around the country. We, we both are big fans of the Close the Workhouse campaign in St. Louis. I know that especially after you wrote your, your book, um, you've, got, you, you've been seeing a lot of the grassroots energy on policing in different parts of the country. Is there somebody doing this better uh, that you've come across in your travels, in your work in the United States? Well, I, I wish I could say there was this perfect city with the perfect police department or, or really more importantly, the perfect kind of administration that's trying to get us away from policing. Uh, we can talk about places that are doing individual parts of what I think needs to be done particularly well and not just in the US, but internationally. So, you know, we were talking about sex work and sex work has been legalized in New Zealand and parts of Australia. There's a decriminalization in, in Brazil and parts of Mexico and parts of Europe. And the results are generally very positive with that. Portugal has you know, decriminalized all drugs and 
turned it over to the public health authorities and the outcomes have been fantastic. We can look at some places out West that have tried to dial back the use of police to deal with things like homelessness, mental health crisis calls, uh, substance abuse disorders. So the CAHOOTS program in Eugene, but even LA County has issued a major alternatives to incarceration report that uh, recommends a, a broad-based shifting away from reliance on policing in the area of mental health services. And frankly, I'm a big fan of Jamani Williams's report on this subject, uh, both about creating a 24-hour emergency crisis capability, but just as importantly, putting in the kinds of community-based treatment infrastructure that prevents these calls from becoming a crisis in the first place. Hmm. You know, there are a lot of movements to, to, yeah. to get rid of school policing. Uh, I, hmm. My last trip before COVID, before the lockdown was up to Portland, Maine, where I was on a panel with the uh, school board superintendent and the chief of police and some local community advocates having a very public debate covered in the newspapers about cutting school police out of the budget. And up there, as in most places, the funding for school police comes out of the education budget, not the police budget. Hmm. Well, you know, when you mention some of those ideas and putting them into practice here, one of the things that gives me, well, I'm, I'm a bit of a perpetual optimist, uh, but one of the things that gives me hope here in New York and gives me reason to believe that we can implement some of the things that we're talking about in our DA race, um, is that we are in the middle of an election to really replace the whole city government, right? We are going to be next spring replacing Mayor de Blasio. We are going to be electing a completely new city council, right? 40 of the seats or so are open, are gonna be heavily contested. New borough presidents, comptrollers, and then uh, the Manhattan DA's race. And I bring all that up because for, for two reasons. Number one, um, my hope is that when I'm sitting in that chair, figuring out how the Manhattan DA's office is going to work with police, how we're gonna hold the police accountable, the person sitting across from me will not be Dermot Shea. I think that would be, that, that would be very difficult. And uh, not that I'm not ready for it, but that would be, when people ask me, how will you get along with NYPD in this office? I have to admit that would be challenging, but my hope is that over the course of the next uh, 13 months, there is a robust conversation citywide about what we actually want policing to look like in New York City. Um, what levels of policing do we want? Um, do we want to get rid of some of the units that you talked about? Do we want to get police out of schools? Uh, so I will be talking about these issues in addition to things that we didn't get to, like uh, what happens when police lie on the stand or what happens when police um, act violently towards members of the community. Um, but hopefully, and I'm, actually this isn't just hopefully, I, I know that, there will be a number of city council candidates uh, that are going to be running on platforms that talk about these issues. My hope is that the mayoral candidates talk about these issues and that by the time we get to June of 2021, there's been some consensus, a progressive consensus on what kind of changes we wanna to make to policing in New York. So that by the time I'm sitting down in that seat, you know, I'm sitting around the table with other leaders of city government who have made a commitment to certain types of reforms and that we're not starting, you know, night and day, but, you know, maybe just like a little bit apart on the spectrum. So that, that's one of the things that I want to raise about the upcoming years that fortunately, I hope this is going to be, this is going to be a citywide conversation. And then the other thing, just because I am running for office and I should mention it, I think it's so critically important for the next Manhattan DA to understand how the politics of policing work, um, to understand you know, the power that the NYPD holds and, and what that means in terms of strategy for how to roll out some of the ideas that we talked about today, who allies are in the community, who allies are in elected office, who opponents are in the community, who opponents are in elected office. Because uh, as we saw with the bail rollbacks of, uh, of this past legislative session, you know, if you come to the Manhattan DA's office saying that you're going to reform the system unprepared for the political pushback, um, you're going to get bulldozed. And it was disappointing to see that happen to some extent with bail this year, but you know we need to elect somebody in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office who is going to fight really boldly for transformative changes to the criminal justice system, but also understands how to 
do that? How to, in, how to engage the politics of New York, especially as it relates to the very strong um, uh, reactionary politics brought by law enforcement and their unions? Yeah, I think that's, that's crucial, that, that we can't understand criminal justice reform outside of the political process. And, and I sometimes say about my book that it's not really about police accountability, it's about political accountability. Because the, the police did not invent the war on drugs and they, they can't end the war on drugs. You know, they, they are following a political mandate. And, you know, they have their own ideas and they have their own political power that they use to try to move the system in, in the most regressive, punitive ways. But if we can put in place a different political paradigm, then that allows us to isolate them politically and to diminish their power by reducing their numbers. And one of the most exciting things I've been working on locally lately is I've been working with the Democratic Socialists of America on a program for next year of criminal justice reform that, that calls for a massive redistribution of resources from the NYPD and corrections into the kinds of targeted interventions that you see in the, in the, build, uh, the build Communities Report and the No New Jails Report and it's a lot of great work that's being done. And I think we have a question, Christina. Yes, so we have a question from Owen who asked, what are some incentive models for police that don't encourage criminalizing communities by meeting some arrest quota? So can you have a kind of progressive quota system or how, you know, how do you respond to that? So first of all, you know, any bureaucracy is going to have productivity measures. And what the NYPD said in response to the criticism of stop and frisk and broken windows policing as like the primary measures is, well, we're going to try to include some positive metrics. Did you have a conversation with a community? member? Did you deliver a baby on the freeway? You know, did you, did you help someone who was in medical distress? And, you know, in a sense, that's a step in the right direction, but it does not get to the root of the problem, which is that, you know, what ultimately, what tools do police have to solve community problems? Well, what characterizes policing is that it is about the potential and actual use of violence. It's about handguns and handcuffs and tasers. And we should be trying to solve as many community problems as possible without relying on any of that. Because police do not have the things that most people tell you they really want for their communities. They don't have access to affordable housing. They don't have access to youth jobs. They don't have access to high quality mental health services. So I feel that instead of putting so much of our political capital into these questions of oversight or prosecution of police, which I don't think is gonna change the fundamental nature of the institution, we need to demand those kinds of community investments that will actually produce safer, healthier communities I think that I, I completely agree. And I think it goes to uh, what problem are we trying to solve, right? And, and that's another way of saying what Alex just said, which is if the problems that we're trying to solve are, you know, things for, you know, young people are gathering in the hallways and that's unnerving certain residents. Well, maybe the answer to that is building a youth center or, you know, coming up with some other productive things that young people can be doing rather than using the only tool that we think we know how to use, which is sending in police. And, and I think you can take extrapolate that towards all kinds of different issues that we've talked about over the course of this hour, substance use, mental health, economic opportunity and desperation. Um, you know, this comes up in the context of domestic violence, which is another issue that we're working on as a campaign and, and didn't get to talk about today, but we'll have policy paper on, you know, when you send police to deal with the domestic violence issue, the only outcome can be arrest. And it can't, it, it often does not get to the core issues of how do we stop cycle of harm from happening uh, and how do we actually respond to what the victim needs. 
So I think in all of these issues, we want to be figuring out what problem we're trying to solve and then figure out, well, what is the best way to solve it? Not sort of shoehorn in backwards, like, well, what should the police be doing with their time instead? So hopefully that, that Alex, you'd say that that's a variation of what you were saying as well. Yeah, and uh, just on the domestic violence thing, I want to recommend a great new book uh, by Lee Goodmark, who runs a domestic violence clinic at the University of Maryland Law School. And her new book is called Decriminalizing Domestic Violence. And she says, you know, in 20 years doing domestic violence work in the criminal justice system, no women have been helped. So it has been a total failure. And that we have got to think through better community-based interventions that are really focused on helping people, not just putting more people in the criminal justice system. So, uh, so we're at about the hour now, uh, Alex. Is there any, um... I'm going to make a sort of plug for some of our upcoming events, but do you want to go first and say maybe how people can follow you or follow your work? Sure. So uh, I'm on uh, most of the social media platforms, mostly using uh, Twitter at Avitale, A-V-I-T-A-L-E. Uh, you can check out our work at the Policing and Social Justice Project at policingandjustice.org. And, uh, you know, I have this new uh, YouTube interview series called The Critical Criminologist, so you can uh, subscribe to that on YouTube. Fantastic. And so for those of you who don't follow our campaign, you can also follow us on the social channels uh, uh, on Twitter at Janos Martin or on Facebook at uh, Janos for DA or Instagram Janos for DA. And uh, some upcoming events that you might find interesting on Thursday night, we have a cooking show every Thursday evening. Uh, this week, we're going to have Samalis Lopez and Jamal Bowman, who are two candidates for Congress. They're two out of the seven uh, candidates for decarceration that we are supporting across different levels of government to help us achieve the kind of uh, reforms that we're going to need. So I encourage people to, uh, to visit our website at janosfordia.com slash events or janosfordia.com slash dinner uh, to sign up for that particular event. It's going to be a really great conversation. So one last time, I want to thank Professor Alex Vitali for another really great conversation, just like coffee, except with people watching. So uh, thank you so much for taking your time and thank all of you for, for tuning in to watch. I, I really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed it. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night.